Well, I've been so blessed with Pastor Curtis's studies on Zionism um, that I wanted to kind of give you my angle. Um, God uses his people. Everyone has a different personality. Everyone has a different background, different research. And two people can speak on the same topic and arrive at the same conclusion and yet approach it at different angles. Some of this will be a little bit repetitive from what Pastor Curtis taught, <clears throat> but some of this will also be new. We want to talk about who are the Jews in Israel today. We've learned a lot about who the Jews are not. We're the true Jews. We're the true circumcision of, of Christ, of the new covenant. Um, so that kind of begs the question, well, then who are the Jews over in modern Israel? And are they fulfilling Old Testament scriptures or even New Testament scriptures? So we're going to look at that. But I want to start off by <clears throat> playing a little bit of a, a snippet of a video by Rabbi Tovia Singer. I've challenged him to a debate recently over the comments in this particular um, video. And I want you to we listen to, let's see. It does explain a right book in the Christian listen Bible. It ends with Jesus saying, Jesus I'm coming back quickly in 2000. Back the claim is made that Jesus is second his second coming when all these gr the great stuff is going to happen is imminent. There are many of you here standing here that will not taste of death before these things will occur. This generation will Sounds not familiar. pass away before this occurs. Look it up in Mark 9, Mark 13. It's all over the place. That means the rise of the New Testament thought that it was imminent. It never happened. Revelation, the last book in the Christian Bible, ends with Jesus saying, I'm coming back quickly in 2,000 years, is not haste. So, the, the second coming idea does explain away a false messiah, and it's, it suffers. Okay, so basically what he's saying is he's saying the, that, that Jesus can't be the messiah because he's a false prophet. He prophesied to come in the first century. Those standing there in his generation, it didn't happen. Therefore, Yeshua can't be messiah. He's a false prophet. So I challenged him to a debate on that particular topic, and we're trying to work through the the proposal right now. Hopefully that will take place. Um, Dr. Michael Brown is a so-called Messianic Jew and he's written a five-volume set, very scholarly, very good. I'll be chewing on the meat and spitting out some of the bones in what he has done. But the problem with Michael Brown is that he's great in defending the deity of Christ, the Trinity, from the Old Testament scriptures <clears throat> to these uh, unbelieving quote-unquote Jews, but he leads them to a works-based salvation. He teaches them Arminianism. It's so it's like taking them from one leaky boat to another leaky boat. So, so what if you prove that Yeshua is Messiah and that he's God, but if you're leading them to a works-based salvation, uh, that's not going to help them much. Um, some people do a really good job in refuting modern-day Zionism. I would say Pastor Stephen Anderson in his video, Marching to Zionism, is a must watch. You should watch that on YouTube. Um, and he teams up with Tex Mars. And these guys do a great job of showing how modern day Jews are not related to Abraham. They're Khazarian Jews. Um, they're Ashkenazi Jews. They're, they're not really related to Abraham. But where they err is they say, well, you know, when Revelation talks about the synagogue of Satan, well, that's modern day Jews in Israel. And when it talks about the Antichrist is going to reveal himself, what's well, not the Antichrist, it's the man of sin, reveals himself in the temple, well, that's going to be a Jewish uh, Antichrist or a man of lawlessness. So their eschatology demands a modern Israel and a modern temple. So they err in the same way that the Zionists, Christian Zionists do. Their eschatology, both of theirs, demands that modern Israel fulfills their eschatology and the New Testament, which is wrong. But they have some good things to say. Just uh, chew on the meat and spit out the bones. <clears throat> so in part one, we're going to be looking at who are these Jews? <clears throat> um, who, who brought them into the land? Um, and what are their proof texts? And how do we answer them? In part two, we're going to be talking about how do we effecti effectively evangelize them um, using their own sources of authority. It's like when we're talking to Reformed folks, they don't care about who we are. We don't have a PhD from Westminster uh, Seminary. But if we're talking about what John Owen has to say or John Lightfoot has to say about 2 Peter 3 being the heavens and earth there is the Old Covenant, then they start listening. So when you're talking to a Zionist or a Jew, 
Um, you want to appeal to some of the rabbis. You want to appeal to um, the Talmud, <clears throat> some of their commentators, some of their best theologians. So I'm going to use a little bit of that approach in this presentation. So we're going to talk about the greater prophet than Moses, Deuteronomy 18, 18. The incarnation, incarnation and the deity of Christ. How and when Messiah would come upon the clouds, Malachi 3 and 4, uh, Daniel 7. And the spiritual nature of the new covenant or messianic kingdom or the uh, messianic temple. Um, the whole concept that Jesus isn't God because he didn't come when he said he would. And that just look out the window, you can see that he didn't fulfill the kingdom because we don't see anything. Well, Daniel 2, last I checked, prophesied of a kingdom that was made without hands. So I think Yeshua is very consistent with that. So who are these Jews and who formed and gathered them into Israel? So let's open, let, let's start the conversation with these guys with just asking some basic questions. If one claims to be a Jew according to race, ask them, well, what tribe are you from and how do you know? If you guys listened to the debate between Gary DeMar and Zionist Jew uh, Michael Brown, the first question Gary DeMar asked is, what tribe are you from? Michael said, I don't know. I think I'm from Judah. Of course, Judah, the spiritual tribe, right? He couldn't prove it, and he didn't know. From that point on, the debate was over, I thought. But unfortunately, Gary imposed his post-millennialism, which I think didn't go over too well. But from that question on, the debate is over. So if they say, I don't know, you ask them, why don't you know? Then lead them to, does it have anything to do with the genealogies being destroyed? by Titus in AD 70. Now AD 70 is at the forefront of your conversation. All right. Now, if they define themselves as a Jew because of their covenant relationship, that is, they've adopted the religion of Judaism, and that's why they're a Jew, then ask them, what is this covenant relationship that you have? If the Messiah hasn't come and the new covenant age hasn't arrived yet, then what covenant are you under? And if you're under the old covenant, why aren't you sacrificing? Well, then they'll say, well, you don't understand. Judaism transformed itself into the prayers and teachings of the rabbis. Ask them, when did that transformation take place? A.D. 70. We're back to A.D. 70. Great. Do you know that some of your greatest teachers taught that the Messiah in Daniel 7 would come upon the clouds and that he would judge Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and that Yeshua claimed that? No way. Okay, so now we're talking about AD 70, we're talking about Yeshua, and we're, we can even get into the deity of Messiah. Let's use their sources if we're going to talk about encyclopedias, okay? Encyclopedia Judaica Jerusalem, 1971. It is a common assumption in the face of evidence to the contrary that the Jews of today constitute a race. What? Their own encyclopedia is admitting that they don't have a race? There's no Jewish race? Um, despite the fact that they've intermarried so much over the years, they have all these Gentile converts, proselytes coming into the religion, many people readily accept the notion that they are a distinct race. They're admitting that they're not a race. The New Jewish Encyclopedia, 1962, parrots the 1906 one and admits that, convert, that um, Khazarian the Khazarian Empire converted to Judaism around 740, that they were run out by Russia, and more importantly, that they were scattered throughout Europe. All right. More recently, historian Jim Wald wrote in the Times of Israel, it is well known that, that sometime in the 8th to 9th centuries, the Khazars, a warlike Turkic people, converted to Judaism and ruled over a vast domain in what became southern Russia and Ukraine. What happened to them after the Russians destroyed that empire around the 11th century has been a mystery. Many have speculated that the Khazars became the ancestors of Ashkenazi Jews, and that's what Pastor Curtis was referring to when he was quoting John L. Bray in his book, uh, Israel and Bible Prophecy, if I remember right. But he goes on, until now, in other words, it's not a mystery anymore, in 2012, Israeli researcher, now this guy is a guy who was born in Israel, all right? And he's doing this genetic research on, you know, some races are 
genetically disposed to certain diseases. And he's studying this at John Hopkins, and he comes to the conclusion that uh, all of, most of us here in Israel, we come from uh, the Khazarian Empire. The, the Ashkenazis are coming from the Khazarian ancestry and not the land of Israel. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Benjamin H. Friedman correctly wrote, these Eastern European Yiddish-speaking Jews who form the Zionist group practically in entire, entirely have neither a geographic, historic, nor ethnic connection with either the Jews of the Old Testament or the land known today as Palestine. Couldn't agree more. Based upon the evidence, now, since that 2012 study, they, they got all kinds of pushback, right? Oh, you know, we are ethnic Jews, we are racial Jews, and this, this genetic study was a scam. Well, they went on to do other studies in 2017, and they, they were very thorough. Based upon the evidence found in one history, that is, finding the historical meaning of Ashkenaz, to the linguistic evidence, that is, studying the origins of Yiddish, and three, genetics, both ancient and modern DNA analysis, the conclusion is, that study, that the majority, 80-90% of Jews in Israel today are of uh, Khazarian Turkish origins. I mean, just look at Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, he's whiter than my behind. There is, I mean, how can we see these people as Semites? It's just, it's, it's laughable on its face. But the genetics are proven it, history's proven it, linguistics has proven it, archaeology's proven it. But be prepared. If you present this evidence to them, they will say automatically, what? You're an anti-Semite. You're a Jew hater. Oh, you're just parroting that, that debunked Khazarian conspiracy theory, you racist. All right. Well, the irony is that the Talmud teaches that the Jew has this righteous behavior. Why? Because he's racially a Jew and he has a soul. But you Gentiles, you don't have souls. In fact, you were created to serve the Jew, the Talmud says. Is that not racism 101? But no, you're the racist, right? You have to feel bad for these modern Jews because of what Hitler did to six million of them. But how dare you talk about 66 million Christians dying at the hands of communist Jews in the Bolshevik Revolution. Let's wipe that away from history, but let's just focus on this. I don't want to play the victim game, victim card with these people. It was, what Hitler did was a tragedy, and I totally understand that. But we have to understand why some of these Khazarian Jews have been kicked out of some of the countries that they've been kicked out of. Let's go over a little bit of the history of the Khazarian Empire. Between 100 to 800, the Khazarian king and kingdom practiced the Babylonian black arts and worshipped Moloch. That is, they sacrificed their babies to Satan. They were road bandits who killed travelers and assumed and stole their identities. That's important to know. They were also a mercenary army and would kill for the right price. They also had very advanced armor um, and were very skilled in warfare. Between the 700 and 800, 800s, the Russians and neighboring countries gave them an ultimatum. You either embrace Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. You have to have some kind of moral base because if you keep stealing our kids and offering them to Moloch, we're going to have a problem here. And so the king adopted Judaism because the, the Catholics were coming in this direction and the, and the Muslims were coming in this direction, and he knew he'd be forced to adopt one of those religions. So he says, I'm going to do the politically expedient thing. I'm going to go with neutral Switzerland Judaism. But as they began studying the Talmud, it's like, wow, this thing's just as wicked as we are. This is kind of cool. So what they did is they ended up stealing and adopting Jewish names. And so, you know, you see these guys in Israel. They're white as can be. They don't look like a Semite, but because they have Jewish names, oh, yeah, you must be a racial Jew. No, not exactly. Not exactly. Uh, <clears throat> the... They claim that a Jew is a, has a superior race. 
The Jew could steal, rape, and kill non-Jews. This is all what's taught in the Talmud. The Jew would one day rule the world having Gentile slaves. They believe each Jew in paradise when Messiah comes and he rules from literal Jerusalem, each Jew will have 2,800 Gentile slaves. Wow, what a wonderful eschatology that is. And there's no racism involved there, I'm sure. Uh, between 1100 to 1200, they are finally run off by their neighboring countries, but they had a very advanced spy network, and they still do today, actually. Um, and they knew the Russians were coming, and they took their wealth, and they migrated into Eastern and Western Europe. All right? Now, from the 1700s to present, now we get into the Rothschilds. All right? Mayor Amstrel Bauer changed his last name to Rothschild. He was an avid student of the Talmud. He had his five sons sit still and they could not move until he was done teaching them the Talmud. He would have long debates and discussions with his, rabbi, his rabbis over the Talmud. Now, he was a goldsmith and he charged interest to the local community, all right, and made a lot of money, all right, because in the Talmud you're to enslave the Gentile through interest, all right. So that's what he was doing. But... He was, see, he was overseeing the estate of William the Ninth, and William the Ninth was a mercenary, and he would, you know, he would attack whoever, the American colonies, whoever had the most money to hire his army would win. Well, he stole $3 million from his army that he was supposed to pay him, and Napoleon was after his booty, and so he gave that $3 million to the Rothschilds because they were overseeing his estate, making the financial dealings, and I don't know what happened to William the Ninth, but they end up with the $3 million. And from there, Rothschilds figured out a way. We're going to make more money if we make loans to governments because then their taxes are going to be guaranteed that we get our money back. And so what they would do, he sent his five sons out into Europe and they would finance two different sides of the war and make money off of it. I mean, how wicked is this? So they would enslave a country by charging them interest and giving them loans to, to get their military equipment. And then after the country was decimated from the war, they would, you know, they were in debt, so they would come to them for more money and enslave them further and further on. So that's what the Rothschilds are all about. And they're just, you know, these Khazarian Jews that came down from Turkey and migrated into Europe. Now, from 1800s to 1900s, the Rothschilds, using the Zionist movement, will eventually influence England and America to help give them their own Zionist state in 1948. The Rothschilds needed a state with a government and a military to protect the Suez Canal and their newfound oil investments along with the Rockefellers. They owned the land the early Jewish settlers came in. They funded the wars to drive out the Palestinians, which some of them were Christians and even funded the government buildings of modern Israel, their Supreme Court, etc. And isn't this interesting? This is another marriage made in hell. <laughs> Not just the Khazarian Empire with the Talmud is a marriage in hell, but you have these Zionists finding Schofield um, right out of jail and a new convert. <laughs> he went to jail for being a fraud. Um, He's a new convert, but he converts to Darby's dispensationalism, all right? And Pastor Curtis has done an excellent job. I don't need to tell you what uh, Zionist dispensational theology teaches. So he's already entrenched in this, but guess what happens? This German Jewish Zionist attorney finds him. He sponsors him, and this guy's name was Samuel J. Untermeyer who was president of an American Zionist agency, so he's trying to get modern Israel to be established as a country as it was, and he was very active in preparing the Federal Reserve Act, which there's nothing federal about the Federal Reserve Act. Those of you that know the history behind that know what I'm talking about. But again, that is these privately owned Zionist banks, mostly, not all of them, but most of them, um, trying to get into our country and enslave us through interest and getting us away from our own monetary system. So this is a great guy, and he's the guy that's funding Schofield, and he pays for all his trips to Europe, 
and sets him up with who? The publisher of Oxford University Press. Wow. Who, by the way, loved Darby. So he's a Zionist. He's a dispensational Zionist, a premillennialist. And he ends up um, promoting and publishing uh, Schofield's quote-unquote Zionist study Bible. In that, we read, God made an unconditional promise of blessings through Abraham's seed to the nations of Israel to inherit a specific territory forever. It's interesting how, and I mentioned this in a question in Pastor Curtis's message, how these Zionists are always talking about the land being inherited forever, but whenever circumcision is talked about as being forever, that's spiritualized in Christ. Well, if I can spiritualize the, the promises of circumcision being in Christ, why can I spiritualize being forever? Why can I do that with the land? That's kind of not a very consistent hermeneutic. He says, there's a promise of blessings upon those individuals and nations who bless Abraham's descendants, and a curse is laid upon those who persecute the Jews. Wow, no middle. Of... Now, in the Old Testament, but not modern Israel, and the false prophecy is given in the Schofield Bible. It has invariably failed ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew, well with those who have protected him, and the future will still more re remarkably prove this principle. Really? Has that happened? Look at America. Well, first of all, let's look at these Jews. Did they prosper when they, wherever they were scattered? No, they were run out by most of these countries. I just talked about them killing 66 million Christians. They're run out by a lot of these countries because once the countries find out what they're teaching in their Talmud about their, them not having any souls and someday they're going to be enslaved to the Jew and the Jews are always trying to take over their monetary system in whatever country they go in and charge them high interest rates, they're like, yeah, maybe we don't want you here. It's not because they're being persecuted because of their righteousness. That's not the, always the case. But if you listen to any modern Jew, that's kind of how they present their history. And I think we need to dig a little bit more into that. And has the U.S. been blessed since the 1940s of accepting modern Israel? Really? I mean, I remember in the 1940s, I mean, the family unit was there. There was a good work ethic, you know. But we've declined in our morals ever since. Abortion, sexual perversions, etc. So, you know, this quote-unquote prophecy in the Schofield Study Bible just isn't bearing out in any factual way. So what happened in 1948? Well, Benjamin Netanyahu, I think he was speaking at some um, Holocaust memorial, he said this, armed with the Jewish spirit, the justice of man, and if you've read the Talmud, there's really no justice in there for the Gentile, and the vision of the prophets, we sprouted new branches and grew deep roots. Dry bones became covered with flesh. A spirit filled them, and they lived and stood on their own feet as Ezekiel, and he's quoting Ezekiel 37, prophesied. And then he cites Ezekiel 37. Well, so Netanyahu comes over, when he has come over here, he always meets with guys like uh, John Hagee first. And then he'll go to our politicians. So he, he knows how to work everybody. So he agrees with John Hagee, yeah, modern Israel, you know, we're the fulfillment of uh, Ezekiel 37, which, by the way, is referring to Israel coming back into the land under Ezra and Nehemiah. It's got nothing to do with 1948. Let's just, you know, get rid of the actual context, right? But what is sad is that if Netanyahu believes uh, Ezekiel 37 was filled in 1948, what are the next chapters in Ezekiel? Ezekiel 38 and 39. What's that about? The end time battle of Gog and Magog, right? All right. So they have to have a national Israel to self-fulfill and do this martyr you know, complex, victim complex, that the Muslims are going to come and surround them someday, and therefore they need to wage war. So they're self-fulfilling at World War III, basically. Um, so it, interesting, people in Israel, some of the religious folks there, they, see, they saw Benjamin Netanyahu as the one who prepares the way for the Messiah, like a John the Baptist. But their version of a John the Baptist is a guy who prepares the way by fighting all the infidels and stealing land. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu has done a pretty good job of that. Um, but they, some of them also see Benjamin Netanyahu as the Messiah, 
whose job it is to fight these wars and to rebuild the temple and to take all of the land and to usher in the battle of Gog and Magog. Should we have an ally in the Middle East who wants to constantly get us in endless wars and to self-fulfill World War III? I don't know. I don't think that's a good Middle East peaceful solution. And if we are allies with Israel, we need to realize this, and we, there needs to be a real big check on it. All right? Uh, one of the rabbis says that the Battle of Gog and Magog are the peoples who will wage war against the Jews before the advent of Messiah. Gog is the ruler of the country of Magog. Gog will lead his people in war against the land of Israel, but will be defeated and God alone will reign supreme. Since Ezekiel prophesied in exile about the return of the Jewish people in its land, Ezekiel 37, supposedly fulfilled in 1948, it is possible that he was thinking of contemporary events. All right, so it's, these guys have their own Hal Lindsey's. All right, and the Muslim world have their own Hal Lindsey's. And they're all trying to self-fulfill the bringing in of their version of the second coming or their version of the Messiah and their version, unfortunately, of this end time war. So with all three systems wanting this war and thinking every contemporary event fulfills prophecy, that creates the conflict in the Middle East. And we as Christian preterists have the answer and we have the solution. Um, you know, and it's a belief that uh, whoever's the Messiah is someone who wages war. Okay, great. That's not good. Because uh, <laughs> all these people want to be the Messiah, right? And rebuilds the temple and gathers people into the land of Israel. So that is a, obviously a serious problem. Gershom Solomon, I think Pastor Curtis may have quoted this. The mission of the present generation is to liberate the temple mount and remove the defile abom defiling de abomination, that is the dome of the rock. <laughs> no problem there, right? The Israeli government must do it. We must have war. The Messiah will not come by himself. We should bring him by fighting. If you have a problem with ISIS and Islam, you better have a darn well problem with that. Ah. Uh. Gets me going. All right, <laughs> problems for the 1948 Zionist proof text. Okay, so uh, all these dispensational Zionists, they go to all these, John Hagee will go to all these Old Testament passages, and I don't have the time to go through them all. But he'll say, look, this is a fulfillment of 1948. This is a fulfillment of 1948. This is a fulfillment of 1948. But when you go to them, you all see that they're referring to Israel coming back into the land under Ezra and Nehemiah under the Babylonian captivity. They're not referring to 1948 in any way, shape, or form. Number one, the, the law, the Tanakh in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 28 and 29, and Leviticus 26, said, I won't bring you back into the land until you repent and you have faith in Yahweh. Did that happen in 1948? Did they accept Messiah? No. In fact, most of them are atheists. And, and the... And the uh, some of the religious Jews over there anyway, 90% of them, don't even believe the Old Testament is inspired. Uh, and even the ultra-Orthodox are a very small minority, and they only see the first five books of, of the law as being inspired. The rest of the prophets are not inspired. They, they might be useful. So, uh, and it's important to note that some of the Torah Jews and even dispensational premillennials do not believe that 1948 was a fulfillment of prophecy because of this very argument. So even their, some of their best theologians say, hey, you're going too far to say 1948 was a fulfillment of prophecy because none of them believed in Yahweh. They, these are a bunch of wicked people over there. They, it can't be a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Um, point three. The other small percent of Old Testament passages that they quote are actually referring to like a double fulfillment where they're coming back into the land, but yet it's mixed with um, a gathering in the land under Messiah. So there's this second exodus that's going to take place. And this is what Peter says in 1 Peter uh, 1, 10, and 11. He says, you know, the Old Testament prophets, they were looking at, at the scriptures, trying to see what time and what manner the Messiah would fulfill these scriptures. And sometimes it's a little, little difficult, 
But a lot of times, new covenant promises are mixed in with coming back into the land promises. And so, like the passage that we cited in uh, Jeremiah 31, they say that they'll be in the land forever. But again, the context is the new covenant. And Pastor Curtis dealt with that in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And here it is. This is Michael Brown's biggest text. He loves this. You know, he quotes it all the time. I'm going to go down in the middle to save some time. Then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me. In other words, if the creation is gone, then Israel will be gone. But if, if the creation continues, then as long as creation continues, then I will always have a physical Jew in the physical land of Israel as a physical nation forever. Right? But... How does the New Testament interpret these passages? Deuteronomy 32, 21 and Isaiah 65, 66 talking about the, the nation born in a day or the nation that would make Israel jealous in her last days is referring to the church. And point A, Jesus, Paul, John, and the writer to the Hebrews gives us an inspired hermeneutic to understand that Christ and the church is the promised new covenant nation. Peter says we are elect holy nation. We are the Israel of God, Galatians chapter 6, and descendants, Galatians chapter 3. And Yeshua, of course, in Matthew 21, said that he was going to take the kingdom from the Jews and the Pharisees and give it to a nation bearing the fruit thereof, and that's the church. We are the descendants. We are the recipients of the new covenant that lasts forever. Matthew 24 32 through 34. Now let's get into the New Testament. These are passages that prove that modern day Israel is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Let's look at them and see if that's the case. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place or are fulfilled. See, the fig tree is Israel. And when Israel became a nation in 1948, that's the super sign that Jesus is coming near. Like Pastor Curtis said, the time clock has started. Well, the time clock screwed up because there was no rapture in 1981 and there was no second coming in 1988. A generation from 1948 was supposed to be 1988, minus seven years for the pre-trib rapture. And how far are we? Well, it's a pretty long generation. So they keep extending a generation just like the Jehovah Witnesses do. Or they forsake it, or, for, or they should forsake that particular view. Matthew 21, Jesus cursed the fig tree as Israel, and he said, you will never again bear fruit. Uh, so that's kind of a problem, right? Jesus says, I'm going to curse the nation of Israel. You're never going to bear fruit as a physical nation. And yet they're saying the fig tree is Israel, and it's going to bear fruit. Kind of crazy. But the biggest problem is, Luke, is um, Luke's parallel rendering of this passage. He says, then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree, and what does it say? And all the trees. Uh-oh, they never cite this. I wonder why. Because if the fig tree is Israel in 1948, then all the trees have to be the other nations. What in the world happened to all the other nations in 1948? They never explain it. I don't know. Someone explain it to me. But clearly, the budding of the fig tree and all the trees in context is referring to the signs. Jesus is saying, when you see the signs, just like the budding of a fig tree, know that his coming and the kingdom are near in AD 70. It's not referring to the nation of Israel in 1948. Of course, they always appeal to the Olivet Discourse. Obviously, since Jesus mentions a flight from Judea, this is John Hagee in his book, uh, for this people, Jews, in Jerusalem, and refers to a holy place and the destruction of a temple, this must mean this is a prediction of a future rebuilt temple and a future flight from Judea and Jerusalem, all of which modern Israel is fulfilling and will fulfill right before our eyes. That is so foolish. Why don't these terms and descriptions refer to the Jerusalem and the temple Jesus and the disciples are actually looking at? And that the flight refers to them going to Pella, as we know Eusebius records. So there's no evidence here of modern Israel fulfilling anything. Luke 21, well, the times of the Gentiles. Well, look at that whole context. Let's look at it. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, that is first century Jews, not 
Khazarian Jews, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. That happened. The Romans took them, spread them out throughout the Roman Empire, all the nations they had conquered. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's amazing. They miss the whole context and they just talk about the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And they take this and they mesh it in with Romans chapter 11 and Matthew 23 and they say, see, the full number, which is a bad translation of uh, Romans 11, the full number of the Gentiles will be saved when Israel, the vast majority of his national Israel will be saved, and that that is what Jesus is referring to. The context is talking about the Gentiles treading down Jerusalem and that that period of time, and it's very clear in Revelation 11 too. But do not measure the court outside the temple, leave, the, leave it out. For it is given over to the nations, that is the Gentiles, Jesus just got done talking about, and they will trample, just like Jesus talked about, the holy city, that's Jerusalem, just like Jesus talked about, for 42 months or three and a half years. So the times of the Gentiles treading down Jerusalem is three and a half years. Scripture interprets itself. It's got nothing to do with the salvation of Gentiles when Israel rebuilds her temple, blah, 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 blah. Nothing. Number four, Matthew 23. Let's go all the way down just because time is running out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He, he talks about, eh, i got to develop this a little bit. <laughs> he says, Jesus, the whole context is Jesus is giving seven woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. He's calling the scribes and the Pharisees, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're the one that kills. Right? Where it says your children, he wants to gather to hear the preaching, but they're not willing to do it, let him do it. That's referring to the common person that Jerusalem, the Pharisees and scribes, were placing heavy burdens on them through the Talmud and their traditions. All right? So behold, your house is being left to you desolate, total judgment context. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now on the surface, that sounds like, oh man, that, that must be some future revival in Israel when all these Jews just get saved. No. The entire context of Matthew 23 is that of judgment upon the Pharisees as the leadership of Israel, not their salvation. Jesus is teaching that he would come in judgment and destroy their house during one of their feasts when they sang on the walls, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They would sing on the walls to the pilgrims coming throughout the Roman Empire to celebrate the feast. They would say, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is saying, I, you're going to be forced to sing this song as you see the, not just the pilgrims coming, but when you see my armies that I'm sending. You're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, yeah, the Lord is coming, and he's coming through his armies, and he's going to burn this city. So it's kind of ironic. Jesus is kind of given a subtle sign here that I'm going to come at one of your feasts. You're not going to know which one. But we know from Josephus that what feast was it that they were bottled up in Israel when the Romans came? Passover. And Paul, quoting in Romans chapter 11, uh, Psalm 69, he says, Let their own table at Passover before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap, and iniquity, to add iniquity to their iniquity. In other words, fill up the measure of their father's guilt, and let them not come into your righteousness. No, it's not the salvation of the majority of Israel that Jesus is talking about. He's saying, you're going to sing this song, I'm going to force you to sing it on, on the walls, and it's going to be a sign of your imminent judgment. Romans chapter 11, 4, in hermeneutics class I teach you, whenever you see the 4 there, you have to ask, what's the 4? Therefore, in context, it's the olive tree, the Jew-Gentile union. Uh, 4, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. What's the mystery in Pauline theology? It's the Jew-Gentile union that Paul says in Romans 16 was uh, present in the Old Testament scriptures so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening, what's the partial hardening? Paul just got done talking about in Romans chapter 9 that not all Israel is Israel and that some of them are reprobate. God has not chosen some. It has happened to Israel until the fullness, that is a complete maturity, of the Gentiles has come in. Come into what? Israel's promises. And in this way or through this process just discussed or better yet, through the second coming in the next verse, all Israel, that is believing 
the believing remnant Jews and the believing Gentiles will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer, that is Christ, will come when? Paul, well, in chapter 13, he says, it's at hand in AD 70. That is when Messiah, Yeshua, would come out from Zion and consummate the new covenant and forgive the sin of his new covenant people. Paul tells us who all Israel is in other places. Abraham is the father of us all. For you, believing Jews and Gentiles, are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So there is nothing in Romans 11 that necessitates a future fulfillment for modern day Israel. None of these New Testament passages we have found any evidence. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. The day of the Lord would bring relief to the first century Thessalonians who are being troubled by the, by the first century Jewish um, persecutors who killed Christ and the prophets. Christ would give their persecutors the same kind of trouble that they were giving the Christians in the events of AD 67 to AD 70. Notice that Paul doesn't say, you guys are going to die a thousand years later, you're going to be raised in physical bodies, then I'm going to give you relief from those people that persecuted you two, three, five thousand years ago. No. At Christ's coming, he's going to give them relief from the persecutors, and the first century persecutors are going to get the same kind of trouble, right? The Romans would give them the same kind of trouble that they were giving the Christians. Now, this happened in AD 66, AD 70. Jews, um, Gentile proselytes from throughout the Roman Empire came to Jerusalem for the Passover, right? They were bottlenecked there. The Christians, when they saw Romans surrounding the city, and then they retreated for a bit, they left. But all these others in Thessalonica, those who were persecuting the Christians in Thessalonica, they stayed because they listened to the false prophets, and they received wrath to the uttermost. Um, interesting, in Thessalonians, Paul cites in the Septuagint, Septuagint he cites Isaiah 2, 10, 19, and 21 and refers it to AD 70, when they would seek to hide from God's glorious presence in the caves. Now Jesus also cites this same Old Testament text, and every commentator will tell you that it was fulfilled in AD 70. Jesus cites in Luke 23, 28 through 30, the same pass, Old Testament passage, and everyone else says that's AD 70. But that's the, in that day, day of the Lord, last day's uh, judgment. And so, Paul is just following Jesus' eschatology. There's nothing in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2 that uh, necessitates a future second coming, let alone uh, Israel, modern Israel. So how could the Thessalonians have been shaken that the day of the Lord had already come um, if Paul was teaching a physical, literal understanding of the second coming? All he would have had to have said is, how can you believe that you've already been gathered and raptured because you're still standing here. He doesn't use that as an apologetic um, because he obviously had a spiritual view of the second coming. But he does refer to some signs, and that is, look at D. The man of sin, and this is where they say, look, we have to have modern Israel because the man of sin has to be in a temple, right? So AD 70 can't be referring to it. We have to have this man, man of sin, the Antichrist, in a temple, so it has to be a rebuilt temple. All right, this is their text. I'm just developing the surrounding context showing you that it doesn't demand a future second coming. Um, but notice that the man of sin was currently being, it said, Paul says, restrained now. This guy must be really old if he's still alive and well on planet Earth, as how Lindsay said, right? Because uh, he was already alive during Paul's time, and he says that the mystery of lawlessness was already at work in Paul's day, just before the Jewish rebellion against Rome would take place. First century candidates include who the man of sin is, Nero, that would be Ken Gentry, Titus, the Jewish high priest, that would be Gary DeMar, or John Levi of Giscala, which uh, John L. Bray takes, and I think he's right, um, who was a pseudo-messiah in established rule in the temple area, and the only thing that was restraining him from, from fighting the Romans was the high priest. And so uh, I think that the high priest is the restraining one because he was saying, no, let's, let, let's not fight the Romans. And then John Levi killed him in the temple. And from there, 
Uh, a lot of historians say that that was the beginning of the war. So going to this passage to say that we need a modern Israel and a modern rebuilt temple is, is bogus. So concluding part one, 1948, nor future or national Israel is the subject of any Old Testament or New Testament prophecy. And uh, what we have right now is just a bunch of Khazarian Jews and the Khazarian Mafia and the Rothschilds over there. There's, this is no blessing from God. This is no miracle of God, 1948 or any of that. They're just trying to usher in World War III, really. And they have that Samson complex. They're like, if you take us out, we're going to take out even some of our allies. So Israel is a really scary ally to have. Part two, let's look at some of this. This is the exciting part. Now, I have to warn you, unfortunately, about in the middle of the message, this is going to go a little bit longer than, than some of my other ones. I've tried to cut out as much of this as I can. Jeff told me that his record is an hour 17. I'm going to try not to, um, not to beat that, Lord willing. All right, Deuteronomy 18:18. 18, 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, that is Moses, from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Who, and whoever will not listen to the words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Now, the Qumran community, before the life of Christ, were teaching that this prophet was the Messiah, and that he would perform miracles. He would even raise the dead. Well, if he could raise the dead, he might be able to raise himself from the dead, especially Isaiah 53. He's cut off. He doesn't have any kids, but then he has descendants. kind of necessitates a uh, resurrection. Not only that, I, I couldn't get into Isaiah 53 in this lecture, but Isaiah 53 is a well-known messianic text. Don't let any Jew tell you that it's not. I, you, it's not even until the 11th century that they started saying it's the nation of Israel. That's a whole other thing. Um, past that, let's go to the incarnation and deity of Messiah. Even in the Old Testament, the complexity of the Godhead was observed in that how could God be enthroned in heaven while at the same time he was seen on earth and people weren't dying when they saw him. In fact, when they saw him, he was as a man. He was eating with Abraham. He was drinking with Abraham. All right, he even wrestled with Jacob and he even led the armies of Israel. I'm just curious, what happened to the body of that man, or in the form of man? And does Jesus need to have a physical body now? When he, back, when he went back to the glory that he had with the Father. I'm just... But anyway, the whole concept of God being a man on earth, but at the same time being in heaven, ruling the universe, the rabbis kind of, this is kind of, this is kind of trippy. Well, this is kind of paving the way for Messiah to be a man, Okay. The Aramaic Targums on the Word. This is awesome. In the Aramaic Targum, that is a paraphrase of the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, these were read in every synagogue before Christ, during Christ, all right? And it said that they substituted the Lord with the Word, or the Word of the Lord, in those following passages. Therefore, in these texts, the Word was what created. It's the Word that walked in the garden with Adam. It's the Word that Adam, Ad, Abraham believed in and was justified by. It's, it said that the word, that, that, that Israel believed in the word. The word rose up and returned in saving and justifying Israel. The word was active in decreeing. The word gave the law. Moses prayed to the word. The word was said to sit enthroned in heaven listening to the prayers of Israel. And on and on it goes. But look at this. This is Jacob speaking. If God will be with me, then the Lord will be my God. What's the Targum say on this? If the word of the Lord will be with me, then the word of the Lord will be my God. The word is what justified Abraham. The word was Jacob's God. Is John being Jewish or not? When he tells you who the word is. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All right. Well, I've got to save some time. But to the point is, they're reading about the word in the synagogues. I'm not even going to get into Philo's Logos. I don't have time for that. But this is what they're reading about the word. And then John says, let me tell you about the word. He's Yeshua. 
And that goes in perfectly with how they understood some of these Old Testament texts. Regardless of what Tovia Singer tells you, who tries to... Tovia Singer is a rabbi, and he goes to Christians, and his job is to be a missionary to Christians to prove that Yeshua is not the Messiah and to convert these people to Judaism. But anyway, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born. That's Isaiah... Did I miss... Yes, I did miss Isaiah 7. Let's not do that. Isaiah 7, 14 in the Septuagint. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin... Now, Zionists want to go to the Hebrew and say, well, you know, this should be translated a, a young girl or something like that. Fine, it can be. But the Septuagint and this Greek word everywhere it's used in the New Testament, outside the New Testament, is always translated virgin. Always. And that's why Beale and Carson say this. The Septuagint use of Parthenions uh, would suggest that already before the New Testament age, at least some Jews had come to link the passages in Isaiah 7 with 9, chapter 9 together and to deduce that there would be an additional longer-term fulfillment of the birth of a messianic king portended by a more supernatural conception. I agree. Now let's go to Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, that's the child of Isaiah 7, to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Michael Brown correctly points out the Targum of Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, while explicitly identifying this as a messianic prophecy, renders the verse in Aramaic with an interesting twist. Listen to this. And his name, the child being born, will be called from before the one who is wonderful in counsel, the mighty God who exists forever, Messiah. They put in Messiah there. This is before Jesus' birth. This is... This is a, a Jewish understanding of this text. It is a messianic text. So Messiah is the mighty God who has eternal origins. doesn't sound that Messiah is just a man. You talk to a modern, modern Jew today, ah, oh, Messiah is just a man. He's, you know, you Christians, you just get that stuff from the Greeks. No, we're getting it from the Tanakh. I don't see any New Testament writer appealing to any Greek mythology to you. They're always quoting the Old Testament scriptures. Get real, man. Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem, Bethlehem uh, who are too little among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Who is this? His coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Who is that? The Targum of Micah 5.2 is messianic. Again, this is understood to be a messianic text. So what does it say? Uh, it's... It, it, it inserts the anointed one, which is the Messiah. So they understood this as a Messianic text too. But the Messiah is from of old ancient times. He's not just a man. He's some kind of divine being. They debated it. They couldn't figure it out. But obviously there's something else going on here. Scholars point out that even Rasha, uh, uh, Rashi, a famous uh, rabbi, he says this. Uh, referring to Psalm 72 and his exposition on Micah uh, chapter 5, verse 2, which says of the ruler of Israel in this text, who will be born in Bethlehem, that his origins are from of old, from ancient times. According to Rashi, he is, quote, the Messiah, the son of David, not just the, the smaller uh, Messiah that gets persecuted. No, he's the son of David. It's the Messiah. As Psalm 118 says, he is the stone that the builders rejected. Wow, that is an incredible admission. Jesus is the stone the builders uh, rejected. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 21. His origins are from ancient times, before the sun was. Wow, the Messiah is not just a man, is he? Another famous rabbi, the Messiah King, he is El God, which is how he is from of ancient times. Well, okay, I'll go with that. Edersheim said, the light of Messiah, in one of their passages, in one of their texts, he says, oh, let me go down to the yellow. Uh, he had hid beneath, he hid Messiah and his glory beneath his throne for the Messiah and his age. When Satan asked for him, it was reserved. He was told that it was destined for him who would put him to shame and destroy him. And when he, and when at his request, 
he was shown the Messiah, he fell on his face and owned that Messiah would in the future cast him, that is Satan, into Gehenna, going down in the yellow. For a Messiah, uh, Edersheim says, this text tells us that Messiah pre is pre-existence in the presence of God and destined to subdue Satan and cast him into hell, could not have been regarded as an ordinary man. So again, according to their own text, Messiah was divine. He was eternal. He's the Word. F, Malachi 3 and 4. Now this is great. I love this. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before the Lord. The Lord and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming, and he shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his ring, wings. Go down. Um, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. I will come and strike the land uh, with a decree of utter destruction. Michael Brown says of this passage, it was messianic. All right, Malachi 3. He says, according to the famous medieval Jewish commentators of David Kimchi uh, and some other guy, I can't pronounce, the Lord refers to none other than King Messiah. However, neither of these commentators took sufficient note of the fact that the Messiah was to come to the temple that stood in Malachi's day, that is, the second temple, AD 70. And note also that it is called his temple, pointing clearly to the divine nature of the Lord spoken of. He is the Lord. The Messiah is Yahweh. Yeshua is Yahweh. I ask you, did this happen? Michael Brown is asking his opponent, Jews. If it did, then the Messiah must have come before the temple was destroyed in AD 70. If not, God's word failed. Mm, very good. But that's not the context of Malachi 3 and 4. Messiah comes as the son of righteousness in the great notable day of the Lord to burn the temple. That's how he comes. It's not referring to his first coming. It's referring to his second coming. Therefore, in the green and the last, I would rephrase Michael Brown's statement to say this. If the second coming of Jesus didn't occur in AD 70 to burn the temple, then God's word failed. Am I oh. And I'm failing because my microphone's falling off. Um, so clearly, if the second coming didn't happen when the temple was destroyed, then God's word failed. And we don't want to be uh, presenting an unfaithful Messiah to the world. John Gill of the passage in Malachi 3 and 4 correctly understood and pointed out that some Jews believe this to be a messianic text. And he applied it to AD 70. And interesting, the Aramaic English New Testament finally found a, a translation that supports my view here. It says, For as the sunshine comes out from the east, and is seen even in the west, thus will be the coming of the Son of Man. Interesting that in my debate with Michael Brown, he said, Well, there's only one passage that I might surrender to 8070, and that's this one. But he wouldn't do it because he knew that if he locked himself in with just one coming of the Lord in 8070, then he would have to accept imminence. And if he accepted imminence, that would, the judgment of the living and dead was imminent, the resurrection was imminent, the new creation was imminent. So he saw the train coming, so he didn't want to do that. Smart guy. But not so smart. Yeah. Daniel 7.13. This is great. The Septuagint reads, the old Greek Septuagint, Upon the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man as the ancient of days. Now this is being read in the synagogue during Jesus' time. It's not that the son of man comes up to the ancient of days. It's the son of man comes as the ancient of days. Even some of the early hymns in the early church said that the son of righteousness was placed in, in the Virgin Mary. And it also says down at the very bottom, the Ancient of Days is born as a child. They had no problem understanding this passage that Jesus is the Ancient of Days. Revelation 1, John is clearly following the Old Greek Septuagint of Daniel 7 because he describes Jesus coming as the Son of Man, but he describes him as the Ancient of Days. So I don't really have a problem with the Old Greek Septuagint. 
especially if we're going to admit all these other Old Testament passages are referring to the Messiah, and he has divine origins. He's called Mighty God. He's called the Lord. I don't have a problem that he's also referred to as the Ancient of Days. Um, now, other people see two different individuals here, and that's where we get the Jewish concept of the two powers of heaven, right? Michael Heiser talks a lot about this. I saw in light vision, and behold, here's person number one. With the clouds of heaven, the Son of Man came, uh, and then the person number two, to the Ancient of Days. That's the Father, and was presented before him. But this doesn't get the Jew out of his dilemma, because in First Enoch, we hear that the white-headed head of days, the Ancient of Days, is accompanied by one who appeared as a man and some kind of divine angel and is referred to as the Anointed One or Messiah who existed before creation. For Ezra 13, same thing. The Messiah is a divine being. He's not just a man. Scholars readily admit the dominant and oldest view of the Jews concerned Daniel 7 13 was that, his, what, that this son of man was the Messiah and that he had some kind of, uh, he was some kind of divine being because he came on the clouds just like Yahweh did. Jews in the Talmud admit that Daniel 7 13 is a messianic passage and you don't get any more important than the Talmud as far as the source of authority. The Talmud sages of uh, Sanhedrin 98a speak of two possible ways in which Messiah can come. A, with the clouds of heaven, that is Daniel 7.13, or B, as a poor man riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. 9, 9, 9. But another rabbi steps in and he says, now wait a second, it doesn't have to be exclusive, exclusive, it doesn't have to be an either or. He says, it may be suggested that these are not mutually exclusive alternatives. Rather, Messiah will be both powerfully exalted on the clouds of heaven and humbly self-effacing a poor man riding on a donkey. That's Jesus. That's Yeshua, right? He came riding on a donkey and he came on the clouds of heaven in AD 67, AD 70 in judgment as the king. And he told those Jews, he says, bring those Jews before me who would not acknowledge me as king and have them slain at my feet. And that's exactly what he did. Very faithful to that prophecy. Um, what else is in Daniel 7? It says that he is given a kingdom, verse 14, but it says that this son of man who comes on the clouds as the ancient of days, it says he's worshipped by the nations. And that is definitely worshipped. It's not serve. You look up that word elsewhere in Daniel and you'll see it's worshipped. Did, did Yahweh, or did Yeshua as Yahweh accept worship? Absolutely he did. That's very Jewish. He gives the kingdom to the saints as an inheritance, but it's a spiritual kingdom and it comes during the time of the Roman Empire. Now the 77's Rashi, one of the most revered Jewish rabbis, understood that this, the 490 years here referred to the time of the first destruction of the first temple to AD 70, the second temple. That's the 490 years. But he also admitted that this prophecy refers to the King Messiah. So one of the anointed ones in Daniel's 77s is the Messiah. He admits it. He even admits of Daniel chapter 2, and in the days of these kings, when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence, the kingdom of the Holy One, blessed be He, which will never be destroyed, is the kingdom of the Messiah. It will crumble and destroy these kingdoms. Now that's very puzzling because if Messiah was to come during the time of the Roman Empire and he's to come within these 490 years that end in the destruction of the temple in AD 70, then where's Messiah and where's his kingdom? Uh, Rashi doesn't really have any good explanations to that, but I appreciate the admission that it is a Messianic text. Uh, and there are some Jews that believed that Messiah would be cut off, he would die, and that there would be this 40-year period before the end of the age. Does that sound familiar to you? Jesus was cut off, but he was raised, and then we have a 40-year period before the end of the Old Covenant age. Very messianic. The New Testament authors are very Jewish in all of this. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, identify that Messiah, I shared with this before, he comes in the 10th Jubilee, and he has to accomplish all of these things. He has to judge the Watchers. He has to judge Satan before that 10th Jubilee ends. And AD 70 still was within the 10th Jubilee. So he did accomplish everything he came out uh, and was prophesied and expected to do. Um, in the Talmud, 
they have this, listen, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do because they've calculated Daniel 77s. And they don't understand, well, what well, Messiah was supposed to come before the destruction of the temple in 8070. They say, our masters taught as follows, of the particular seven-year period, that's Daniel's last seven, right, after the 69, at whose end the Messiah, son of David, will appear. All time set for redemption have passed, and the matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. All time calculations had been fulfilled, for they are apt to say, since redemption has not come at the time expected, it will never come. So what are their theories? Good grief, what are they going to do? Well, first they say it's just a hopeless situation. He's never going to come. I mean, if he didn't come when Daniel said, then he's just never going to come. I mean, it's total despair, right? Others are like, well, no, man, we've got to rework this whole thing. Well, this was another view. Messiah was actually alive on earth during the events of AD 30 to AD 70, right when he should live, or was present. And, but God took the Messiah up to heaven because Israel wasn't ready for him. That's why. And then the, number three is my favorite. Daniel erred in his calculations. Just blame Daniel. <laughs> That's Daniel's fault. He must not be inspired. Wow, yeah, no problems there for the Jew, right? All right, Daniel 77s. It was understood to be messianic. And the first, let's prove that all of six of these were fulfilled in 8070. And I'm going to go through these very quickly, all right? Super fast. Even Zionist Michael Brown admits that the very first thing that Messiah was to do happened in 8070, which begs the question, why didn't the other five events happen in 8070? To finish or fill up transgression, Hebrew scholar Michael Brown says, ah, that's Matthew 23. That was fulfilled in 8070, when they filled up the measure of their sin and the temple was destroyed. Okay, well, if that event was fulfilled in 8070, and Daniel says the whole 490 years prophecy is about Daniel, your people, the Jews, and your city when it's destroyed, Jerusalem, then all six of these have to be fulfilled in 8070. Put an end to sin. The book of Hebrews teaches that Jesus, Jesus it, um, as the new covenant high priest, would come out of the heavenly temple a second time apart from sin in a very little while, and would not delay to fulfill the day of atonement at the end of the old covenant age. Paul taught Jesus' new covenant day of salvation was at hand. And that's when he would come out of Zion to take away sin and establish the new covenant. So all the New Testament authors are looking to AD 70 as for all of these events to, to be fulfilled. To atone for wickedness or the covering over iniquity. Same concept as number two. I would uh, appeal to those scriptures and maybe a couple other ones. In the new creation, God doesn't remember our sin anymore. New covenant creation. And our sins are covered in the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 19. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Peter talks about a salvation and an inheritance foretold in the Old Testament prophets that we read about earlier in communion. Being the world of righteousness that was ready to be revealed and, and was at hand and thus fulfilled in 8070. This was the salvation of the soul. Peter doesn't think that the, the burning of the elements and all of this and the new creation has anything to do with the physical planets. He's like, the, the inheritance that's ready to be revealed is the salvation of the soul, the forgiveness of sin. If that's not exciting enough for you, then go buy a Hal Lindsey book at a garage sale. I don't care. <laughs> Paul taught they were eagerly awaiting the righteousness that was about to be reckoned at Christ's coming in A.D. 70. Again, this righteousness, it wasn't just at the cross. The righteousness would come at his parousia in A.D. 70. To seal up vision and prophet, Kyle and Dalej write this. Prophecies and prophets are sealed, that is, they stop or cease. When by the full realization of the prophecies, that is, when all the prophecies are fulfilled, um, fill more prophecies, uh, prophecy, that is the gift of prophecy, ceases. No more prophets, that's offices of prophets, anymore appear. Summary, when Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled, the office of prophet ceases. There's no more need for that office anymore. Michael Brown claims to be a Messianic Jew who's a prophet, and he's made false prophecies. And uh, that's, a prof that's a problem, because in our debate, I specifically appealed to this passage and proved that the office of prophet ceased in AD 70, yet he continues to mislead many people claiming to be a prophet. Uh, and Paul taught that Christ's second coming was soon, um, and that which is perfect, therefore the office 
of prophet and the gift of prophecy also ceased in AD 70. And the last one, to anoint the most holy place. As every vessel in the Old Covenant tabernacle was anointed with oil, God's New Covenant most holy place people of God are anointed and baptized in the Spirit. To not be deceived and to trust in Jesus. To not be deceived by the Antichrist who were saying that Jesus was not the Messiah, 1 John. The church as God's most holy place is where Christ and the Father now dwell. So we are the most holy place dwelling of God, and we are anointed with the Spirit. And that temple, as Pastor Curtis eloquently um, taught in his last message, has been established, and we're it. Um, so just to sum up here, what do they believe? Messiah would, would be a man, but he would be a divine and have or, uh, divine origins, eternal origins. In the 70th week, that is the la last seven, in the 10th Jubilee, he would be cut off. Then there would be 40 years would follow before he would come upon the clouds as the Ancient of Days, the Lord, as the Son of Righteousness, and burn up the temple. That is New Testament eschatology, and I just proved it by citing all of these um, Jewish sources. So the New Testament is completely consistent with them. The spiritual nature of the temple kingdom. This is my last point. Hang in there. Um, so what happened? Why did, all, why did the majority of the Jews reject Yeshua and his kingdom in AD 70? Short answer, Deuteronomy 32. He says, Is, In Israel's last days, the Jews would heap up for themselves their sin. That is, they would fill up the measure of their father's guilt. Matthew 23. They would become utterly, utterly corrupt. In a perverse generation, a future generation, that Peter in Acts 2.40 says was his generation, quoting this, and he says this, you will not be able to discern what your end will be. It's a prophecy telling the Jews you won't be able to discern it. Isaiah says it's going to be a strange work. Why would it be a strange work? Because they were expecting God to destroy the Romans, not them. They didn't discern it. But look at point A. Daniel 2 foretold a spiritual kingdom. The Jews hated this. They wanted an earthly kingdom so bad, just like all the other four kingdoms. But, but uh, Daniel is told that it's not like the other kingdoms, and Israel's kingdom is included in the four kingdoms because the fourth kingdom is mixed with iron, that's Rome, and clay, that's the Jews. That's from the Herodian uh, dynasty, which, which was mixed with uh, the Romans and the Jews. What did Jesus teach? Te Jesus taught, my kingdom, that is of Daniel chapter 2, is not of this world. What did Daniel say? It's not cut with human hands. When Jesus says it's not of this world, he's appealing to Daniel. Yeshua is a perfect Jew. He's citing the Tanakh in all of his theology. John chapter 6, they wanted to make him an earthly kingdom. He withdrew because it, that wasn't the kingdom he came to establish. That wasn't the kind of kingdom that was prophesied in the Tanakh. Luke 17 and Luke 21, it's when Messiah is revealed from heaven in his contemporary generation that he says, you're not going to be able to say, see here or see there, for the kingdom of God is within a person's heart. All right? Consistent with what Daniel chapter 2 teaches. So all of this, you know, Tovia Singer, I know that Jesus isn't the Messiah because I just roll down the window in my car and I look outside and I just see evil everywhere. So obviously Jesus isn't the Messiah. Michael Brown, well, I know that Jesus' second coming didn't happen because I just roll down the window, I look outside, and I say, see, the kingdom isn't here. Jesus says you won't be able to say see here or there. He says you're not going to be able to look out the window and do that. So don't mock Christ when you do that. The Qumran community believed that they were Ezekiel's temple. They believed that they were the most holy place of God. Look, he gave you authority, O oh ye. This was how he glorified when you sanctified yourself to him. When he made you a holy of holies for all. The Qumran community, before Jesus' time, they had a spiritual hermeneutic of the Ezekiel temple. They were the most holy place of God. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. Jesus says, according to the Old Testament scriptures, living waters are going to come out of you. What Old Testament scriptures, Jesus? Ezekiel 47, living waters come out of that temple. 
Revelation 21, 16, that's the most holy place. That's the perfect cube of Ezekiel 40 to 47. 2 Corinthians 6.16, citing and referring to Ezekiel 37.26, when Paul says, you are the temple, he's appealing to this Old Testament passage. He's appealing to the millennial temple. Even in the dispensational study, Ryrie study Bible, or the MacArthur study Bible, my former pastor there, um, they admit that Paul is referencing this Old Testament scripture. Well, if Paul says that we're that temple, who are we to say, well, yeah, kind of, sort of, but we're waiting for another one. We're adding to scripture, as Pastor Curtis pointed out in the last message. And I'll end with this uh, admission. Schofield gave the Zionist farm away on the sacrifices of the Ezekiel temple, all right, the millennial temple, that they interpret as literal. He says this, the references to sacrifices is not to be taken literally. Wow. In view of the putting away of such offerings, but is rather to be regarded as the presentation of the worship of redeemed Israel in her own land and in the millennial temple. You, now, this is important. Using the terms with which the Jews were familiar in Ezekiel's day. Oh, okay. So Ezekiel is describing uh, New Covenant language with sacrifices because that's what they understood but the sacrifices aren't literal people if the sacrifices aren't literal the temple can't be literal where the sacrifices are performed and then if the sacrifices aren't literal and the temple's not literal neither is the city or the land that the temple is standing on and that is the hermeneutic of the new testament period case closed debate over Conclusion, modern-day Jewish or evangelical Zionists have no Old Testament or New Testament text to support modern Israel or modern Jews fulfill any prophetic event post-8070. We must present the real Messiah, the real Yeshua, who is the faithful and true prophet, priest, and king of the scriptures to do the Zionist community and that of his sovereign and free grace. There is no other Messiah and there will never be. Amen. And as patriot biblical Christians, we should be involved in forming a truly biblical and U.S. America first Middle East policy that will truly bring messianic peace. Not the peace of the old covenant world, not the peace that the Gentile world can give. Only Yeshua as our Messiah can give us true peace. As Peter says, the salvation of the soul, the forgiveness of sin. All right, let's pray. Sorry that went long, but I hope it was worth it. Lord, thank you so much. Gosh, your, your word is so wonderful. And I just love when things come together. And Lord, I pray, Lord, if possible, that debate can happen between me and Toby Singer. I would love to defend that you are our Messiah and that your kingdom is glorious. And it was never meant to be seen outside, but was established firmly in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, so much that you and, your, you and the Father dine with us daily. May we dine with him today, Lord, as we go out to lunch and fellowship with each other. In Yeshua's name, amen.